conference organizer for putting together such an exciting conference at such a beautiful location and for giving me the opportunity to share some of my uh, recent research with you. As we heard already plenty earlier this week that, uh, and also in the talk by uh, Roman, there, the way of planetesimal, from the way the planetesimal form is still one of the main challenges in understanding planet information in general. And so I thought maybe we can turn the problem around and instead of trying to study in detail the formation of the planetesimals, we can see what constraints does our solar system give us, um, and actually also debris disks, on the initial planetesimal sizes. So, um, when we, so in general, the way we, we can you know, split up, or we split up plant formation in different stages, the first stage is the stage that's still very poorly understood, it's the formation of these planetesimals. So, assuming that we formed these planetesimals, uh, the next stage that we think is, in general, important in plant formation is what we call runaway growth. Um, so, uh, it's called runaway growth because the growth, the growth rate is proportional to the radius of the object size. So, the bigger you are, the faster you grow. And your runaway growth exists in many different astrophysical uh, systems. Um, but in, in the context of plant formation, um, it happens because you increase the physical cross-section of a body by gravitational focusing because the relative velocities between the planetesimals and the growing bodies is less than the escape velocity of the growing protoplanet. And so you can get this phase of runaway growth. And so runaway growth is important because you can form you know, sizable bodies fairly quickly in a fairly short amount of time. However, it's also um, pretty inefficient. Um, why am I telling you all this? Well, um, it looks like that our Kuiper belt has been stuck at the end of this runaway growth phase. Um, and so therefore, it would be an ideal, it's an ideal laboratory to test our understanding of runaway growth, and we, I'll be using it in this talk to constrain actually the initial planet decimal sizes. So in the Kuiper belt, planet formation never went all the way to completion. <laughs> because the velocity dispersions of the growing um, planetesimals was excited before you're able to form all the way to planets. So, for, so uh, why am I saying that we think that the Kuiper got stuck at the end of this runaway growth? Well, partly you can ask, you can calculate analytically kind of the sizes you can grow to in the runaway growth regime, and you find it's roughly the size of Pluto. Um, and then you can compare in detail the observed size distribution of the objects on the Kuiper belt with our models of runaway growth. And that's exactly what I'm showing you here. So I split it up in two parts. So uh, people who are experts on the Kuiper belt, they, we typically um, split up the bodies as two populations. It's not really so important for this talk, but just that you know, so we call them cold bodies. that are just bodies that have inclinations less than five degrees. And the hot population are just bodies that have inclinations bigger than five degrees. And the blue here and the red is the data, and then this line is just the, the, the size distribution that we get from runaway growth. So this is just the cumulative number, so the number of bodies bigger than a given radius is a function of radius in kilometers. And so Pluto would be kind of up here with a thousand kilometers in size. Um, and I put down all the different observations here because it's been a huge effort to get such a good size distribution. But the point is that um, I think the um, observed size distribution of the Kuiper belt matches really well our models of runaway growth for both actually the cold and the hot population in the Kuiper belt, with the only difference that the biggest bodies that we find in the hot population are somewhat bigger than the cold population. So the biggest bodies have grown to slightly bigger sizes, which is consistent with the idea that they might probably form somewhat closer to the sun. So, so what are the key points about runaway growth? So the runaway growth, as I said, is actually fairly inefficient. If you calculate how much mass you can convert of the initial population into these large growing protoplanets, it's actually only oops, about 10 to the minus 3 of the initial mass it's present if you do it at the distance of the Kuiper belt. So it's less than 1%, so 0.1% roughly. It's interesting, though, because if you take the minimum mass of a nebula and extrapolate it all the way out of the Kuiper belt, this efficiency factor, this 10 to the minus 3, if you multiply it by the surface density of the minimum mass of the nebula, roughly gives you the current observed number of large objects on the Kuiper belt today. 
And then the size distribution in this runaway tail is roughly equal mass per logarithmic mass spin, so which is a differential power law index of four. Um, so if we, we parameterize the size distribution by uh, dn dr, which scales as a radius as a radius to the minus q, where q is this power law index. And so the growth becomes self-similar, and that's why I could fit the same distribution in the, on the previous slide to both the hot and the cold population, although they had slightly different maximum sizes. So it's really this tail here, oops, it's really this runaway tail that, is, that matches the observed capable size distribution. But that's not the end of the story, because as I told you, most of the mass during those runaway growth actually remains in these smaller planetesimals and never forms into bodies that are hundreds of kilometers in size. So, and we know that the Kuiper belt didn't stop there. Um, the growth in the Kuiper belt was shut off um, by excitation of the velocity dispersion and the bodies there. And so, once you excited the velocity dispersion way above the escape velocities, you transition from growth and coagulation to collisions and destructions. <coughs> and so, uh, we basically get a collisional cascade. And as you probably all know, there's a very simple way in which you can actually get the size distribution you expect when you have a collisional cascade in equilibrium. And you can derive that fairly straightforwardly by um, realizing that you must have a constant mass destruction, destruction rate and because you can't pile up mass at any given size bin. And then you can simply write what this mass flux is. So you have the mass of the target that's being destroyed. Then you have basically the covering fraction, so the number of targets you have times the radius square, which is the cross-section, divided by the area of the disk. And then I have to multiply it by the, by the number of bullets that I have to break up a given size body, um, and this kind of the rate of bullets crossing the disk, so how many attempts do I get to break a given body. And you can, you can see that this simply scales as the number of my targets times the number of my bullets times the radius of the tar target to the fifth power. So all you now need to decide to get a size distribution is how your, how your bullets relate to the target size. So what kind of bullet do I need to break up what kind of target? And so you recover the famous Donani spectrum with a differential power law of uh, 3.5 if you assume something close to the strength regime, basically where the radius of the bullet is just proportional to the radius of the target, and that gives you all this famous Donani spectrum that we all know and love. If you know you can repeat this exercise and now assume that the bodies are predominantly held together by gravity and then you, you have a different relation between the radius of the bullet and the radius of the target in which case you get a size distribution that's closer to a power law of three. And so the, the, why am I telling you all this? Well, because uh, we are interested in modeling a regime where actually most likely we're transitioning from what we call the gravity regime, so bodies that are bigger than a few hundred meters in size, we think are predominantly held together by their gravity, so it's gravity that's determining the size and shape, um, to the material strength regime, where bodies are predominantly held together by their material strengths. So if you now apply such a collisional model, um, having this transition from the gravity to the material strength regime, you, assume you, you would expect to get two different slopes in your size distribution. And so now, using this um, and applying this collisional model to the Kuiper belt, I should say we used actually the, the strength laws determined by Leinhardt and Stewart, um, as well as very simple ones like just assuming everything is held together by gravity, um, and apply that to the Kuiper belt size distribution as it was left over as the end of the runaway growth. And what we find is actually something slightly more complicated than you would naively expect by just the transition from the gravity to the strength regime, and that's because we had all this planetesimal mass left over you had this big bump in, in the 1 to 10 kilometer regime from the runaway growth itself. So it was not a, a, not a smooth power law all the way to small sizes. So let me explain to you what we actually find. So um, for small sizes, you do recover exactly what you expect for an equilibrium collisional cascade in the strength regime. Um, and for the largest sizes, we don't find any collisional evolution as expected because the collision time is just longer than the age of the solar system. So then you would have to wait longer than the age of solar system to originally destroy a body in the large, uh, of the large Kuiper belt objects. So the dashed blue line is the size distribution that you had at the end of runaway growth before any collisional evolution. 
Now you let the system evolve collisionally for the age of the solar system, and we get this solid blue line. Uh, the red points here are the <coughs> observations, and you can see the agreement with the observations is very good, and you can see that um, you have a collisional break here at roughly at 30 kilometers. Um, and then uh, we have a fairly steep rise. So actually, this break here gives you a size distribution of two, which is shallower than you would expect from a simple collisional cascade. And that's because you had this excess number of bullets around a few kilometers that <laughs> depleted this 10 kilometer region more strongly than you would expect it naively from an equilibrium cascade if you had a smooth power lot to start off with. And you still maintain some excess mass here that has not been fully depleted over the age of the solar system. And this is kind of a signature of the initial planetesimal size distribution. You can see it gets shallower with time because there was even steeper here, but it, there's still, it still is a signature um, before you recover the standard equilibrium cascade. And so it agrees well with the direct observations we have of the capital size distribution. And it also agrees well with upper limits we have for occultation surveys um, by, t by TAUS and the HST survey that we did. And, and so uh, if we start with an initial planetesimal population that was roughly a kilometer in size, this was for half, like 0.4 to 4 kilometers in size, roughly equal in <coughs> mass, we find good agreement with the data. And so now we repeated this same exercise, um, this time with a planetesimal population that started off with bodies that were where most of the mass is in bodies at 10 kilometers in size. And we find that we can actually not match the observations. So what I've shown you here, again, is the observations down here from direct KBO, uh, KBO surveys. These are the limits from the occultation surveys. And you can see um, that if we assume the strength laws from Leinhardt and Stewart, that we cannot match the observations because we have way too much mass still in this 10 to 20 kilometer regime. Basically, when you start off with planetesimals, or to planetesimal size distribution, where most of the mass is in bodies that are bigger than 10 kilometers, you can simply not erode that mass over the age of the solar system. So that mass is still there, but we just don't see it observationally, so it's just inconsistent. Uh, so it looks like you cannot form the Kuiper belt if you started off with the planetesimal by coagulation, if you started off with a planetesimal size population where most of the mass was in bodies bigger than 10 kilometers. And we even went to the extreme and assumed that bodies are only held together by gravity, which is like the weakest thing we couldn't come up with. Um, and even then, we cannot um, reproduce the data. So it's like the dashed line here. It's just inconsistent. So um, what we find is that the size distribution uh, for objects in the Kuiper belt that are bitter, bigger than 30 kilometers, it's primordial. It has not been modified by collisions over the age of the solar system, um, simply because there is no, was not enough time for uh, a given bullet that could destroy bodies bigger than 30 kilometers to hit the target in the age of the solar system. If you would wait longer enough, that break would move to larger sizes. Um, the lo in the location of the break that in the size distribution is very well matched, um, by these collisional evolution models. And to me, at least, there's very strong evidence that our Kuiper belt is a true analog to the dusty debris that we see around other stars. We really, I think, have some observational evidence that they're for this collisional evolution going on in our, in our solar system, too. Um, most interestingly, I think the initial planetesimal sizes, size distribution does leave a signature in the size distribution of the Kuiper belt, even today. Um, that we can try and go and look for. So it's not actually erased um, by collisional evolution over the age of the solar system. Um, we find that uh, we cannot match the observations if we start with planetesimals that are bigger than 10 kilometers, where most of the mass is in planetesimals bigger than 10 kilometers. Um, and actually, there's been a lot of other work, for example, looking at derby disks. They also find that they cannot match the, in order to match the luminosities, of the debris disks and their, their brightness uh, as a function of time, um, can you and Bromley find they also need to start with planetesimals that are smaller than 10 kilometers. Uh, and there's been also work on the asteroid belt. Uh, we heard that uh, from one, there's work by Morbidelli that uh, uh, shows that you can reproduce the asteroid belt size distribution if you start with bodies that are 100 kilometers in size. 
And there's been also some work by, by White and Schilling that finds that you can reproduce the sites of the asteroid belt if you start off with bodies that are less than a kilometer, about 100 meters. But I think most interestingly of all is really the fact that we have a test of a prediction. So if the Kuiper belt really formed by coagulation from these kilometer-sized planetesimals, there is a signature even today in the, in the population of 1 to 10 kilometer-sized bodies. And we can look for it. And actually, we got uh, several nights on the dark energy camera to actually do exactly that test. And we figured out because it's hard to probe the population in the Kuiper belt because it's just too fine to do it well from the ground. But there are centaurs. These are bodies that are escaping from the Kuiper belt. And because they're coming closer to us, um, we can actually prove the sizes of bodies if you look at the centaur size distribution. And we were, um, this is what we proposed to do. And we got the observing time. And I thought I can actually show you already some results. Unfortunately, the camera broke, broke two days before observing run. <laughs> I don't know if that means you should never have a theorist on your observing proposal or something, <laughs> but so you'll have to wait a little longer uh, to know the answer. However, I want to leave you with one uh, maybe intriguing observation, and that is I recently learned that um, from, from people, especially David Minton, who is um, modeling the size distribution um, on the uh, Saturnian satellites, that uh, they infer the falling impact of size distribution. So basically what they do is you know, Cassini returns these beautiful images um, of their satellites of Saturn, and people count the craters on them, and then they use that to back out an initial impactor uh, size distribution, just from the size distribution of the craters. And itself is a very hard problem because it depends on the strength of the bodies and the velocity of the impact. However, if you assume that all the satellites have been impacted by the same impactor size distribution, then you can get rid of all these degeneracies and the size distribution that they find is shown here. And when I saw it the first time, and they think these bodies come from the Kuiper belt or the outer solar system, that are these impactors. And I thought there's no way that the size distribution of the Kuiper belt could be anything like this. Well, after I did this work, I went back to this paper and I was like, oh my goodness, it looks to me, I was just very surprised. So they find something which to me seems extremely surprising how similar it is. So they also find this deficit of bodies with a shallow size distribution just around 10 kilometers, and then you have a steep rise in the, between the 10 and 1 kilometer regime, and then you, uh, it becomes shallower again, and finally you, you get into the um, material strength dominated regime. So whether this is uh, any proof or not is up to you, but I thought it was just very intriguing to, for me to see uh, that they found something quite so similar. So thank you very much. Very nice. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, yeah. Okay, just a very quick question to make sure that I understand the things properly. Um, in all your collisional simulations, did you assume uh, a compact, massive Kuiper belt of the Nice model, the pre-LHB state, or the uh, essentially the current one? Um, it, is, it assumed the Kuiper belt you get at the end of runaway growth, which means that you didn't have more massive bodies, so there were no additional bodies that are um, is big, you know, bigger than 30 or so kilometers, but you had more mass, but all that mass, as I showed you before, was so contained in, the small, in smaller bodies. Above. Yeah, yeah, but what, what was the total mass, for example, of that Kuiper belt uh, you start with? Uh, uh, was it like, like about it is now a Mars mass, or, uh, no, or no, it was it much, was much more? No, 50 ten, Earth masses. Ten, 10 Earth masses. Okay, so it's essentially uh, uh, consistent with the uh, Nice model, what you assumed your setup, yeah? It definitely, that it's consistent in the sense that there's more mass in the Kuiper belt back then, yes. But I would say that most of the mass stayed in smaller bodies. And you placed it closer to, uh, to the sun. I mean, it was not having the radius of 40, 50 AU, basically, but instead uh, 30, whatever, uh, 20. No, the collision evolution, um, I did all at 40 AU at the current location. Because it affects collisional lifetimes and so on, so that's why I'm asking. Every, Sorry, everything would be affected, the collisional lifetimes and, and the efficiencies and, and so on. Well, I think uh, the, the, the growth efficiency, yes, but I think the collisional evolution probably happened once the Kuiper belt was in place as today, because it's happened over a long period of time. Okay. okay. Uh, we just uh, then couldn't, and then we'll go over here. Do you have a question? Or? 
Go ahead. Um, so, so first I have a comment, and then I have a question. Um, the comment is you do constrain that the planetesimal cannot have initial size, something like 10 kilometers. They have to be smaller. But you cannot constrain they're actually really small. No, totally. I totally agree. Okay, totally so that's just common. I totally, right? So actually, uh, none of the work, so if I, I on purpose actually did not uh, deal with planetesimals that were, say, 100 kilometers or small in size, because they were, for them, if you want to grow the Kuiper belt with such small bodies, you actually have to worry about them. They will start colliding within the growth time scale of the Kuiper belt. So you have to decide how the collisions amongst those small planetesimals um, affect the growth, whether those small planetesimals will break, and if you lose them, or whether you can accrete them. Um, and so yeah, I totally, so I am not constraining that, and I think I think that uh, it would be interesting to think to see how well you can match the observed Kuiper belt size distribution, and it would give you a different constraint on the small bodies, I'm sure. And so observationally, I think we can distinguish between those two scenarios. So that would be very exciting to do. Right. So my question is actually, I'm asking it uh, for the sake of the chair, because our chair has done some work on constraining how much mass was in the Kuiper belt in the early stages, um, I thought the limits on binary Kuiper belt says that there cannot be much mass. It, sorry, in what? In what? Maybe, uh, maybe JJ uh, can I, do it. I can ask the question for myself. Yeah, why don't so, you ask the question? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that we uh, uh, found is that you know, there's a large number of wide separation binaries right. in the cold component. Right. And that tends to imply that there can't be Oh, there can't have been a very large population of objects. Actually, yeah, no, actually, I looked at this at the limits from Alex Parker. Yeah. yeah, and actually, it's interesting because most of the mass is still in the kilometer size. I actually found that they are not able to destroy the binaries. But if, if there would be in 10 kilometer size bodies, right. you would destroy them all. Exactly. So it's, it's consistent, I think. Okay. Um, and they could be even smaller bodies. Again, so the limit, I think, the strong limit is that I don't think the plant decimals were bigger than 10 kilometers. But I, I, I calculate actually the binary. To, um, disruption rate for these kilometer size bodies, um, given what we find as a result of this collisional evolution, and it, it's it, it's consistent with the limits of um, Alex. We actually talked about it uh, uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're going to stop questions there, uh, uh, and uh, thank you very much.